How's it going? Good. How's it going with you? Oh, I'm pretty good. So nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, yeah, I think I found you through one of your students. Yeah, I was looking at her work. Oh, that's very good. I was like, hang on a minute. She's she's still <laughs> learning. Who's she learning from? And then I found your work. I was like, oh, my God. OK, now it all makes sense. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Great. Great. Yeah, I've got a lot of sort of lucky. I have a lot of pretty great students. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, right now, if you're listening, I'm uh, talking to Devin Cecil Wishing. In, you're in New York, aren't you, Devin? Yeah, New York City. And just to give you time context for our conversation, today is Friday, the 18th of August, 2023. So if someone's listening and they haven't actually seen your work, how would you describe it, Devin? It's a good question. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm primarily an oil painter, mostly working in uh, the still life genre. I would say it's definitely, I would say working in a somewhat traditional mode, definitely an emphasis on um, depicting light. More so than that, I mean, I, you know, I, <laughs> Sounds like a cop out answer, but I think beyond that, uh, looking at it is really, really the <laughs> best way to to gauge it. Uh, <laughs> Hang on now, look, we're on an audio podcast. You can't pull that. I'm an artist. I'm not good with words. <laughs> Everybody, get your phones out. Google my website. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I think that's a pretty good description. I think, I, and I particularly like the. Um, what you said about light, that's quite poetic. I hadn't really thought of it like that. But as soon as you said it, I was like, yeah, okay, working with light. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so just to put your artistic sensibilities in context, who are your creative heroes? Are they all painters or is it spread out to other artistic schools? Yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of painting, I um, like a lot of the old um, Dutch and Flemish uh painters so i actually just got back from a trip i was in amsterdam and and looking at a lot of paintings so there's a, a lot of guys over there who are a lot of my favorites i mean so amsterdam is a wild city for painting isn't it like oh, it's yeah. just amazing how much it, it's kind of fallen off the walls or everywhere you look it's just little galleries big you know the reich museum is just wild yeah. It's an amazing city, even, isn't it? The, even the airport there, you know, there's like yeah. a, a, an art gallery in there with all these old master paintings. It's it's like amazing. I was saying to somebody the other day, you know, I, I know for different people, they have kind of their, their places. Florence is, you know, their, yeah. their Mecca or Paris is, you know, their spot. And, and um, for, for me, very much it's Amsterdam. <laughs> um that uh, an insane amount of uh, phenomenal paintings uh, have come from there and have, you know, sort of uh, arrived there. <laughs> yeah. Did you notice this? When you think of Paris or, say, Florence, like you mentioned, they're very big art cities, but there's some kind of um, self-awareness about it. They're a little, bit, a little bit too, you know, aware that, art you know it's you know ooh, look at the art whereas in amsterdam it's just really part of the scenery it's just there's no kind of it's just very grounded or something it, it's just very ordinary like uh, extraordinary paintings for sure but the presence of that kind of painting in the city is not i don't know it's not that it doesn't have that um woo you know we've got some amazing art here did you know what i mean I, I've spent a very limited amount of time there. I, I, I was there in in 2006. I was there for for Rembrandt's 400th birthday. Uh, I went on a trip there, and then I, I was just there for the second time this year. And uh, so I'm, you know, hesitant to like sound like I know too much about the place or anything because I, I really don't. Oh, look, but... feel free. I do it. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. <laughs> there, there. <laughs> From my experience, at least, there there is a very sort of like, uh, 
Dutch quality to that in a way. There, there's a very sort of like a surprisingly understated matter of fact kind of kind of vibe there, you know, which I I actually kind of love. There's like a very sort of like directness about it, and you know, was, we're talking about there, there's you know in a way that people kind of associate with New York sometimes, right? I mean, people, mm. you always hear New Yorkers are very like direct and to the point. And, and it, I sort of found myself, you know, wondering if that was maybe some like way left over, you know, sort of Dutch influence or something. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dutch people struggle in Ireland because of that directness. Yeah. I have a few Dutch really? friends. Yeah. Because I, everyone in Ireland is very, I mean, I think it comes from a combination of, you know, being colonized by the British for so long. You couldn't be direct. You had to sort of speak mm. in a very circuitous way. But even among ourselves, it's, it's over, overly polite. You know, nobody says, I don't like you or I don't, uh, you know, <laughs> no, I don't want your tea. You're not very good at making tea anyway. You know, whereas Dutch people will say that. And they won't yeah. say it in a nasty way. They'll just, you know, say, would you like a cup of tea? No, I, I had some the last time I was here and it was, wasn't was very good. So I'm not going to have any this time. <laughs> you know, they'd say that to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, does, doesn't go down well. It sort of short circuits Irish people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't, don't know how to handle that. <laughs> yeah, understated. That's a very good description of it. Um. So what's your, what's your backstory, Devin? How did you end up being an artist? Yeah, um, you like you like comics. You get you know you know backstories. I do. Yeah, right. <laughs> I um. Oh no, origin origin stories. It's origin stories in comics, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, backstories in movies. I uh yeah, <laughs> I uh yeah. It, it actually has a lot to do with comics. Um, so I I mean I always kind of just as a kid. I mean like drawing and making stuff and 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 ma making almost anything with my hands really i think has always been and still is a, a really appealing thing to me but uh when i first started really getting kind of interested in art um it was maybe about 12 or so and um i saw a movie actually it was, it was called crumb it was a documentary about r crumb the the comic oh, yeah. comic artist and to my like 12 year old brain at the time was just like oh this this is the thing <laughs> right this yeah. is the thing for me this is great this is this is what i want to do and and uh so i got really really into drawing you know cartoons and comics and stuff and and you know from from that you know sort of you know found other artists that were kind of in his circle and uh, so started looking at people like, you know, Rick Griffin and Victor Moscoso, Gilbert Sheldon, all those sort of Zap Comics crew of people. Um, and uh, was really, really big into that. And, and of course, that took me into their poster work and things like that. And, um, and, uh, and, and that was kind of, you know, my main real interest for a long time. And, and at some point, I don't remember exactly how, but somehow that kind of led me to um salvador dali who whose work i got really really into in in like you know sort of around high school and uh you know it was sort of a similar kind of feeling i was like oh this guy's great who is what is this all about and and at that point you know as i don't know maybe 17 or 18 uh, i was um like started thinking like oh like yeah i want to make stuff like that like i i've got ideas and stuff for paintings but i didn't have the technical skill right i mean so i had never really handled paint before i was all pretty much pen and ink you know up till that point and mm -hmm. so i was like all right i want to learn to paint and um so basically at that point i i signed up for art school so i went to you know an art college out in california and um uh not really knowing <laughs> much of what that experience was going to be like uh it was just like i don't know i want to learn how to paint and so i'm going to go to a school and they're going to teach me right <laughs> and uh so i went to to art school out there and very very quickly i um uh realized that their their painting department was not really going to teach me <laughs> uh at least 
how I wanted to paint. And, and so yeah. I wound up actually joining the illustration department um, because not that I uh, especially planned to be an illustrator, but um, they were, you know, kind of talking about drawing and stuff, right? Um, it, you know, picture making was was an actual conversation. Um, and so I, I wound up studying illustration. That was what I did my, my degree in. Uh, I think like with a lot of things, I mean, I, th I think it's easy when you're in the middle of something to kind of get excited about it a little bit and, and you know, so I was like, oh, okay, illustration, like, yeah, this, this seems like a cool thing, you know, and I was like, maybe, maybe that is actually what I'm going to do, you know, and yeah. um, so I got out of school and I, I started, you know, pursuing that a little bit um, and started doing some work and, do, you know, doing illustrations for, you know, this and that and, and and you know at the time i was like wait all those guys i liked at first like crumb and rick griffin and all those guys they were kind of illustrators anyways right <laughs> mm, i was like this could be yeah. good and so i started doing a little bit and and you know getting some gigs here and there and um really really quickly i i was like oh wait no this this <laughs> this wasn't the thing i wanted to do <laughs> and uh by my, my problem i think i i'm was like ill fitted for that gig i think and and uh, an awful lot of it was i i have this horrible um <laughs> i don't know if it's a habit or a a, a handicap or or what but uh at, as soon as the picture was not exactly what i wanted the picture to be i just lost like all interest in making it <laughs> and right. so it just took the i mean tiniest little tweak from any art director to my original idea for me to just like oh, oh god i have to do this thing now and and, and so pr pretty quickly <laughs> i was like yeah i don't think this is for me um yeah that's pretty much the kiss of death as a commercial artist isn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> and 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 it was and and it wasn't even that their tweaks were were bad or anything you know it was like i always understood why they were making them it wasn't like i was yeah. like oh this guy's an idiot and it was nothing like that you know but for x y or z reasons they needed it to be something else and but to me i'm like oh but it just makes the picture worse and you know um so you know i i don't know i just wasn't wasn't the thing i wanted to do but but around that same time i very much by accident um found this atelier back in oakland and um i was like wait this is this is kind of the thing i really wanted to do like i just wanted to learn how to paint <laughs> and yeah, right. and uh here's all these people who are you know kind of interested in this this same thing and and so i started studying there and, and i was there for a few years uh studying at nights and and at, at the same time um, started teaching a little bit. And so I, I started uh, teaching. It, it was in San Francisco is this art gallery uh, that had an after school program. And it was for like, um, it was all for like low income high school students. And they'd come after school and, and, and learn how to draw and do different things. And, and, um, yeah. and I had actually been a student there when I was in high school. And then after I finished college, they invited me to come teach. And uh, so, yeah, I started kind of teaching drawing a little bit there. And then um, then I was you know, studying, studying painting at night. And that um, that school uh, wh where I was studying basically was all still life. And um, the our teacher had a, a, a rationale that I actually still think makes a fair amount of sense, uh, which was that, you know, he said, look, even if you want to work with the figure or something later on, just like you don't need to pay a model to learn the basics <laughs> like just put mm. an apple or a coffee cup or something up on a shelf and like let's start there <laughs> and uh right. and so so we painted still life right and and it was just a way of um kind of figuring some things out technically really right um but in the process of that uh, again i mean i think it's easy to get sort of interested in you know kind of whatever you're doing and uh, so I started looking at still life painters, you know, more and started getting kind of more, more into it as a genre. Um, and uh, then after a few years there, um, I found out kind of through essentially word of mouth there about, uh, you know, Jacob Collins here in New York and uh, the GCA and, uh, 
you know, saw what they were all doing and I was kind of like, Oh man, like I gotta, I gotta go there. They've, they've got some stuff figured out <laughs> and, uh, so, got some skills. I, yeah, they, they, they know stuff I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I wound up coming out to, uh, to New York to study there and, um, uh, was there for a number of years as a student and wound up kind of teaching some classes there and, and kind of, kind of stuck around, uh, which yeah. is where I am now in New York, uh, painting and, uh, teaching at, at the uh, Grand Central Atelier. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, but just when you said GCA, I'm glad you clarified that. Just in case someone's listening, what's GCA? Sorry, yeah, Grand, Grand, Grand Central, Central Atelier. Atelier. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, so you came to New York and never went home, <laughs> or it became pretty home. much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. yeah. So. How does the idea for a painting start for you? And in particular, how do you record, you know, those wispy bits of, I want to say inspiration, you know, the little ideas. Are you a sketchbook person? Do you write things down like text wise? Do you make little voice memos? Like how do you grab those and record those little bits of, yeah, I think I'd like to do that as a painting. Yeah. Um, I think it can start in, in, lots of places lots of times for me there's there's some particular thing that uh i want to base the painting around so you know it'll have um i'll kind of have the lead actor figured out almost <laughs> right uh before there's actually like a, a movie so to speak um so oftentimes uh something will sort of pop into my head right like i want to paint a um fish <laughs> and um and so like right yeah fish painting i'm gonna paint a fish and so i'm gonna i gotta find a fish i'm gonna get a fish i'm gonna paint this fish and and uh usually i have some you know general I idea of what the whole painting is gonna be and i find nine times out of ten when i actually get the thing and sit it and you know sit it in front of myself and kind of arrange the things my my first thought is usually like oh this looked a lot better in my head <laughs> this, <laughs> now that i get this all in person i'm like oh this is so doesn't everything... stupid this thing is <laughs> like sorry doesn't everything look better in your head just for me anyway. maybe you know <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's always like, oh, this thing is way bigger than I realized in comparison to this other thing. And it doesn't fit it all the way I, you know, was sort of envisioning it. And, and so then I just start kind of, um, <laughs> kind of playing around with it and say, well, let me sort of move this. Let me, let me take this out, move this and maybe put something else in. And, um, so it depends, right? It depends on the painting, but but in in the context of a still life, let's say where where I kind of have everything there at the same time and it's kind of set up, you know, simultaneously in front of me, um, I I usually think of it as just a lot of playing, um, and so I'll just with the actual objects themselves move things around, put something in, take something out, switch the sides of something, right? Um, play with the lighting, right? Move the light around to get different, you know, kind of shadow shapes and things like that. Move myself around to get a, a different view of things. Um, and usually I find, you know, a couple things will start to click into place, right? Uh, that, okay, I have my original thing that I liked, my, you know, first object that's going to be kind of my star of the show and then maybe one thing i'll start to look kind of good with i'm like okay there's starting to be a little relationship between these things i don't really know why i don't know what it is but but i like these couple things together the rest of it's still a mess but like these two things are starting to look good right and uh so I'll keep those, right, and move the rest of stuff around, take things out, put things in, and 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 just sort of play with it. And um, I am always a big kind of advocate of the idea that if if something starts to feel right, that it's good to trust that. <laughs> that I'm like I don't know exactly why I like these two objects together, but I I just do right and yeah. so okay there, there's something there and i 
don't like the rest and so i'm gonna mess with it still right and yeah. uh largely most of the time it's just a matter of kind of playing around until the whole thing kind of kind of gels into place um so in the context of you know sort of a still life um lots of times uh, if it's something that i'm going to be working on for a, a little while um you know if it's an alla prima painting or something it's a little different but uh but but if it's something i'm going to spend a while painting uh it's not at all uncommon for me to spend a day or two just like playing around with the setup kind of moving things around um playing with the cropping so sometimes it you know starts out as a horizontal and then winds up being a vertical painting by the time that's right. done right it can sort of morph around quite a bit but uh i think uh, pretty much without fail by the end of that process uh i've got something that that i ultimately like better than whatever my original kind of conception for it was <laughs> was going to be <laughs> Ah, very good. Um, when you were saying there at the beginning, you know, that some you get the thing and then you go, oh, this is way bigger than I thought. <laughs> do you get other bigger things? Like, do you, you know, get, oh, I have to get a bigger jug now and I have to get a bigger, you know, or do you like move it further away or do you just go and get a smaller version <laughs> of the same thing? Yeah, I mean, all of the above uh, wind up happening. Um, so sometimes I'll I'll wind up putting in new things that you know compositionally fit better than my original uh, ideas for objects. Sometimes I will get a bigger or smaller thing. Um, sometimes even uh, the the original thing that was sort of the impetus for the painting will wind up working itself right out of the composition uh i gave an example to some of my uh some of my classes that for for a while uh i had this this white taxidermy chicken and i i kept wanting to paint it and i kept every painting i was like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna paint this chicken and then i'd start setting things up and i'd work things around it and it just kind of wouldn't work out and the painting would morph into something else and the chicken would kind of work its work its way out of the composition and I'm like, okay, well, I'll paint the chicken next painting and, and, you know, make some other painting that it morphed into. And, and then, uh, the next painting I'd be, okay, now I'm going to paint this chicken and I'd put it in and start putting stuff around it. And, you know, nothing ever quite worked and it would sort of work its way back out and something else interesting would happen and it would turn into some other painting. And, and, uh, and for, months and months i was like one of these days i'm gonna paint this chicken and, <laughs> and eventually i did and eventually i put this chicken into a painting and i was like okay i finally i finally did it i painted my chicken <laughs> um, but uh I, I, again i mean i i think one of the nice things about <laughs> you know not not working um uh for for a commercial purpose i mean of, of you know just making your own paintings is um you can actually just allow that to happen that if it starts out as one thing and then turns into some completely different painting from what you envisioned you can you can actually just see that process through uh that you can kind of take that journey with the objects and let the painting sort of you know become what it wants to become uh so oftentimes that that happens to me no, not always sometimes i have an idea and, and it works out and i do the thing very closely to what i originally envisioned but but more often than not it goes through a a, a fairly lengthy journey of you know becoming one thing and then another and before finally um settling on the thing that it becomes yeah yeah, it's so funny to to hear you talking about it because it really does sound like a casting movie, um, and you're you know yeah. getting the actors and you have all the squabbles among the actors and like okay that's it you're fired you're off the set. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty do, much. <laughs> <laughs> do you have like a house stuffed full of things that were you know you were waiting to to get into paintings? Um, sort of. Um, you know, I, um, have moved my studio a few times, uh, and so I, um, had, I had a studio actually at 
the Grand Central Atelier for a few years. And then uh, just a little bit before the pandemic, I, I moved into a new apartment and I had a little more space. And I said, I'm going to I'm going to paint from home. I'm going to move my studio into the apartment. And um, at that point, I kind of cleared out right I, a lot of the stuff that I had. And I was like, I've got a lot of stuff that I've painted before. I've got a lot of stuff that's just been sitting here for forever and I haven't painted and I'm going to let it go. And so I, I kind of really cleared out most of my stuff. And, and then uh, in the new studio was kind of like, well, <laughs> now I don't have any stuff. <laughs> I got <laughs> to start, start getting some things. And, and so I started, you know, building up a little stuff and uh, had a, a little, little collection going. And, and then I moved again and, and pretty, pretty well did the same thing, really cleared out a lot and sort of started from, from scratch. And so I've been, here in this studio i think i guess all uh, two and a half years something like that uh two or two or three years and and uh so I, i'm starting to kind of build up a collection again and um uh so it no no doubt will build and and then i'll sort of purge and uh so it, it kind of goes in cycles a little bit like that there's things that i keep there's things that i really like that i know i'm gonna probably use you know multiple times and and hang on to but uh, a lot of stuff i kind of i kind of tend to cycle through because otherwise it it does it just gets a little crazy uh, eventually because you there's always new ideas and new stuff that you know i want to try and new stuff i want to get and uh in a new york apartment you sort of can't keep everything <laughs> yeah yeah um i'm wondering is it similar to uh say portrait artists who or people who, you know, figurative artists, you know, they'll see somebody in the street and they'll go, oh, my God, they've got a fantastic face. And they'll go up to them and say, you know, I'm a painter. I'd like really like to paint you. Do you have a similar kind of thing with objects, either in shops or in people, other people's apartments? Go, Could I, Can I borrow that for maybe three months? <laughs> yeah, I, I've definitely I've definitely borrowed stuff from people <laughs> for paintings. Um, yeah, I think it can, you know, happen all all different ways i mean sometimes i just see a thing and i'm oh, it's a great thing i gotta you know get that and paint that um other times i'll i'll have the idea first and then kind of go looking for a thing to go you know hunting, fit, yeah. fit the role you know um it just depends you know um or i'll search for a general category of things and go see what i can find you know um yeah. so all, all different different ways really um this might be redundant but i'll ask you anyway do you always work from life or do you work from photos at all um i don't always work from life but i don't ever work from photos um and what did you say you you do I always work I mean, from life or you don't always work from life i don't always work from yeah, that's life what i thought you said but I don't ever work from photos. Um, so the reason that I say that um, is, for example, um, this past week. Uh, so I, for anybody who saw the promo image for this this uh, episode, has seen uh, I have a little fluffy white dog named Nyoki, um, and. Uh, she hangs out in the studio with me and uh um so this week i decided I, i've been wanting to paint her forever uh for since i got her and uh i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna just do it this week i'm gonna start doing some little little studies of my dog um but uh my dog i mean i knew going in that like getting her to sit still or pose in any kind of way is like out of the question um and uh so i said well i'm gonna just try painting her from memory right like i look at her a lot i know kind of what she looks like i can kind of imagine like if light was coming from this direction like what that would sort of do yeah. and um so i just started doing a little um series of of little head studies basically of, of her but but from memory right so um it's it it's not really fair to say that it's from life right because it's not mm. like she's in front of me 
posing, right? I mean, it's from from memory, right? Memory, imagination. Um, um, so, so that's why I say I don't always necessarily work from life. Um, mm. I am actually very particular about not working from photography, though. Um, and um, I always say I, I think it's a very very different activity um to work from a photograph than it is uh to work work not from a photograph i think you know working from photography is a very amazingly specific thing to do um and it it's not a thing that i find terribly interesting personally um right uh, but yeah obviously you know everybody has different opinions about that. I mean, if other people work from photos who are listening, like do your thing, <laughs> God, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's just not the thing that I am particularly in love with doing. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got another question about that later on. So uh, from somebody, so we'll, oh, we'll okay. put, a, put, a, put a pin in that one, come back to it. Yeah. Um, okay. So you've got, you've arrived at your final arrangement. You're happy. Uh, everyone on set is getting on with each other. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you do color studies before you start the main painting? It depends sometimes. Um, and it depends a lot on the painting. Um, so if I do really have everything set up in front of me at the same time, you know, uh, to the point where I can, you know, like look at it through a viewfinder, let's say, and say like, yes, that's going to be the painting. Um, I actually usually don't. Um, I usually kind of just dive straight in. Um, if it's a picture where I'm um, sort of frank and signing different elements together. Um, so I've got a painting that I'm doing right now where uh, I'm, painting some birds and they're kind of in a setting and there's kind of like a landscape in the back a little bit, a little, little bit of landscape, not a ton, sort of in one corner. Um, and I'm really just kind of putting all the different elements together in the painting, right? Like none of these things mm. actually existed in the same time and the same place in, in reality, I'm sort of compositing them together in the, in the picture. Uh, for something like that, oftentimes I'll do a lot more preliminary work. So, um, you know, it, in that case, I can't actually nudge the objects around until I like the way it looks the same as I might with like a, a still life. So in that case, um, I am, you know, going to my sketchbook, I'm doing some thumbnail sketches of different, you know, compositional possibilities, how I want to arrange the picture, um, kind of working it out at that level, doing individual drawings of all the different elements, uh, taking, you know, maybe some studies and things, uh, and, you know, sort of putting them together in the painting. Uh, in that case, definitely, you know, I'll, I'll do a color study. Um, and basically, it's not so much a matter of like, you know, well, how light or dark does that thing need to be so much as just, well, I don't know, how light or dark do I want that thing to be, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's a lot more decision-making in a way uh, than when the the uh, entire setup is is in front of you at the same time to kind of, you know, compare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that case, you probably wouldn't do a color study. Is that what you're saying? I usually don't. Um, yeah. Mostly because I'm, you know, reasonably just confident in feeling like I can make those decisions as I make the painting. Um, uh, yeah. The the more that I'm kind of making up, uh, the the more likely I am to do a little little more preliminary work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what does the drawing phase look like? Like, what do you draw with? Your paint, charcoal, pencil. It depends. It varies. Um, so sometimes um, I'll use like, a, you know, do a separate drawing, like just on white paper with a, you know, graphite pencil, work out a whole drawing ahead of time and then transfer okay. that onto a canvas. Um, particularly if it's like a little more technical, right? Uh, so if there's like 
a lot of ellipses that need to be really perfect or something <laughs> like I'll, I'll I'm be more likely to work out a drawing ahead of time and transfer it onto the canvas. Um, if it's something that's a little more um, organic um, where there's like a little more leeway, maybe um, I may just dive in with paint, uh, you know, directly just sketching stuff out with a brush on the canvas. Um, Sometimes if I have like a toned canvas, I'll, I'll start with like white chalk and do my drawing directly, you know, sort of a rough drawing uh, in white chalk on a toned mm. canvas uh, and then start painting onto that. Um, it depends, all, all different, different ways. And when you do a drawing and then you transfer it, what's your method of transfer? Um, it depends, I have a couple. Um, sometimes, uh, I'll put, uh, I'll usually make a photocopy of the drawing just to put it on, um, thinner paper. It makes a transfer easier than straight off of drawing paper. Uh, it also makes it really easy to change the scale. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, that lots of times that, you know, I usually just, if I'm going to do a drawing ahead of time, draw it at whatever scale feels kind of comfortable to draw at. And uh, then oftentimes I'll just use a photocopier to kind of blow it up before transferring yeah, it on. That's a real canvas. illustrator um, trick or it's a real illustrator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think, think of bad things, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and uh, so I'll sometimes, you know, uh, just put graphite on the back of that and then trace over it to transfer it onto the um, canvas. Uh, again, sometimes I'll, if I've got a toned canvas, something like that, I'll put white chalk on the back and do a transfer okay, yeah. that way. Uh, um, uh, usually those are kind of kind of the two ways I would tend to, if I'm going to do a, a separate drawing and then transfer it, usually those are kind of the ways I'd do it. Right. Uh, so you mentioned canvas. What do you, what do you like to paint on? You know, substrate, substrate wise. Um, it depends. Mo uh, most recently, uh, I've been using linen, uh, mounted on, onto panels. Um, so, uh, I'm using dye bond as the, the panel portion of it, uh, and then mounting some linen on top of that. Um, That's uh, dye bond so is the aluminium stuff, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it's the um, uh, two two sheets of aluminum with basically some kind of plastic core on the inside. Um, yeah, I like it because it's uh, um, it's rigid, right? Um, but I, I also like that you don't need a table saw to cut it. <laughs> and <laughs> as as someone who does not own a table saw, <laughs> that is a big selling point to me. Um, so I'll usually get that, uh, you know, at whatever size and then um, mount linen on top of it. Uh, lately, my favorite linen has been um, Clausen's 66. It's kind of like a slightly rougher, uh, like oil primed linen. Um, okay. And uh, that's what most, I, I bought a whole roll of it not long ago. So I'm, I'm kind of just using that at least until the roll is gone. <laughs> but, how, how do you... uh, but that's been my favorite lately. Right. How do you stick the uh, canvas to the dye bond? Uh, I use jade glue. Um, so, which is what, basically like that? a, yeah. it, it's like a PVA. So it's just like a white oh, okay. glue. Um, and uh, it's like a, I, I think it's used in book binding, uh, like originally. Um but uh, yeah, basically just picture a, you know, a white glue. It's like a fancy Elmer's glue, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I'll use that to just glue the linen onto the panel. And um, and then it's pretty, pretty much ready to go. Right. Do you do a grisaille? Um, not usually. Um, so... I'll usually do some form of underpainting. Um, uh, what I do most of the time is an aboche, um, which is basically uh, more or less kind of like a thinned down full color uh, version of what the final painting is going to be. Um, right. And then I'll paint kind of on top of 
of that. Um, and uh, I'm I'm usually just as much as anything kind of anxious to get some color in. Um, and uh, yeah. so I, not that I've never done a grisaille, but I, I tend to prefer getting some color in in the first layer rather than a, a totally monochromatic uh, yeah. first first round. Okay. Um, so are you a direct painter or are you more using glazes, building up in glazes or what way do you work? Um, some of each, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think for the most part, I always say, I think a lot of, um, I think a lot of, you know, schools of painting sort of fall somewhere in this this um spectrum uh, of you know kind of kind of having a common idea uh which is i think if you look at a lot of you can find exceptions of course but uh, if you look at a lot of uh historical schools of thought on painting uh they kind of fall into a, a pattern of of some form of an underpainting that you're starting with uh essentially kind of a main layer on top of that and then maybe some uh sort of thin uh adjustments on top of that right um so kind of a a more or less kind of three phase system um which more or less is kind of the way i um tend to paint particularly if it's something that's like a more uh you know, sort of lengthier project. So I'll usually do some some variation of of like an abosh as my underpainting. Uh, then there's basically what I'd call kind of the main path, uh, which is uh, you know going on top of that where you're going to see kind of ninety percent of what the final painting is going to be is that main path. And uh, then on top of that, lots of times I'll do some, you know, glazes or scumbles, maybe build up a few impostos here and there, kind of as a, a finishing um, finishing round, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it, other times I'm painting more direct. So, you know, like I said, this week I'm doing little a la prima, like dog heads, <laughs> right? Which are very, very direct. <laughs> one yeah. one layer, one sitting uh, and done um so i kind of i kind of switch back and forth a little bit um i i, I always say i kind of i kind of like to go back and forth between like longer projects and quicker ones uh that usually mm -hmm. if i finished up painting that i've been working on for a while i'm kind of usually ready to do some quicker stuff <laughs> and yeah. i'll do you know some all prima stuff for a little while and kind of get that out of my system a little bit and then at a certain point i'll kind of feel like eh, i'm starting to feel ready to work on a bigger thing again and you know I'll dive in on on something like that so yeah. i think that back and forth i i always kind of kind of enjoy yeah that's understandable yeah do you have a particular medium you like to use or always use uh, a medium like to, to mix in with oil paint, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, my go-to is uh, Oleo Gel uh, the, by Rublev. Okay. Um, that, that I use for like 90% of, you know, my medium needs. <laughs> yeah. Do you, uh, do you have a favorite color palette that you always start with? Uh in terms of the the like selection of colors of paint that i'm putting yeah the out, number mean? the spread you know some artists are you know they're just very zorn they're just like oh i mean i use two colors or you know or oh, oh no, it's nine <laughs> but you know or i have like 36 <laughs> colors you know always I always start off with my big palette you know yeah i it varies you know um sometimes um sometimes i'll set up a much fuller palette depending on the picture uh sometimes i'll i'll put out a much uh sparser palette um it it depends it it changes around a, a fair amount I don't, I don't know that i'm ever that extreme in either direction i guess um i i mean i have definitely you know heard artists say that they're 
palette is like you know 45 tubes of paint or yeah. something like that and I, I i i'm never that extreme i mean i i would say i kind of <laughs> i don't know alternate maybe between sort of you know five and 15 tubes most of the time on my palette yeah. um yeah, it seems to be like a just a personal thing. I I, I, I know this sounds really <laughs> like simplifying it, but it seems like it comes down to whether you like mixing or not. <laughs> like it seems like <laughs> artists that have big palettes, they don't like mixing paint that much. You know, they just like they like to be in the flow and grab it and get on with it. And then the other p artists, it's all it's you know the mixing and the creation of the color is really important to them and their process you know, it can go both ways in, in a sense. Um, because, you know, when you really limit your palette down in, in some ways, you, you almost do less mixing in a way, you know, in, in a certain way of thinking, um, just in that your, your options are so limited. <laughs> that yeah. You've only got actually so many choices uh, that sometimes with a big palette, you can wind up doing a lot more mixing almost um not necessarily that but that's true um but i i don't know I, to me i think i think about it in terms in some ways i i always say i mean the the biggest difference to me always between a somewhat larger palette and a a somewhat smaller palette is, is how much potential for chroma you have um yeah. There are some exceptions. You could have a very, you know, few number of colors that are all really high chroma, in which case you probably will do a lot of mixing. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, to me, I think lots of times it just depends on on what vibe I want the painting to have. Uh, that uh, at certain times, I want a lot more chroma. I want to be like sort of popping different, you know, bits of color into into it to give it a, a sort of more vibrant kind of feeling. Um, other times, I think a really limited, you know, palette with sort of a more muted, uh, you know, sort of lower lower chroma range can can be really great. I think, and it has its own own sort of appeal to it. And so, uh, from painting to painting, I'll, I'll sort of you know bounce around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, the more muted palette, it actually, in some cases, if it's done well, I've seen, you know, and you probably have too, um, it can actually, m the finished painting can look way more chromatic than, you know, because it's like everything else is muted. And then if there's one bit of color, it really, it's almost like a neon light. In <laughs> going oh, <on>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, limiting, um, a limiting identity can be a really fun thing to play with i mean um and uh you know i always i i play music and i play guitar and so i i use a lot of like you know uh musical analogies a lot of the time and and i i think it it, it is kind of a difference between like you know playing with like a full-on like rock band versus like sitting down with an acoustic guitar just yourself mm. right yes. um that it, it's the same instrument right i mean it's they're both you know guitars right it, it, like it's all just painting ultimately but um but the the things that you'll do the things that you can hear the things that you can't hear right are, are going to show up differently right yes. um and those little tiny subtle you know nuanced shifts between you know sort of one earthy color and another one are really, really going to become, you know, very, very noticeable if you're really, you know, limiting things down in that way. And so it, it can yeah. be a really fun thing to see, like, how much can you do with with less? Um, and then there's other times where you just you just want some more chroma, <laughs> right? You're just like, <laughs> I want that yellow to be really, really yellow. <laughs> you know? yes. uh, so, you know, I, I think it can be fun to kind of switch things up, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what's your brush preference in both, you know, the make of the brush and the shape? Um, almost everything I do kind of tends to be rounds. <laughs> um, and I, I have some flats that I use every now and again for something, but, but almost always I'm using round brushes and, um, 
uh the main thing that that i like about them is they're, they're just so versatile um that you can depending on how you load it on on your palette you can you can make them into all these sort of different shapes and get them to behave in different ways and they're really sort of like a nuanced tool um much i think more so than a lot of the other shapes actually um uh so i, I usually gravitate towards rounds um so I, i've got like really small ones and really big ones and you know all lots of them um the the ones that i'm using most at the moment uh I, i've got a lot of rosemary brushes um and so i've got like their i think series 99 is their pointed red sable uh which you know for more finishing you know delicate work i think are really great uh i've got a bunch of their um uh chung king uh bristle brushes the round ones uh for more underpainting or you know uh scrubbing or things around or real impasto stuff things like that um and for the most part um kind of bouncing back and forth between those the the soft sables and the and the um uh more rough bristly ones um i've got a couple just like uh cheap blick fan brushes if i need to just like <laughs> knock down a little texture somewhere every now and again um but uh th those are the ones that i'm kind of mostly using at the moment very good and what kind of palette do you have uh i've got a wooden palette it 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 holds uh, you know a handheld one um it's uh it's this this company in pennsylvania they're they're called new wave palettes um and i've had i i talk about <laughs> I talk about my palette all the time actually because i love it um uh I've had this one palette of theirs. I, I got it like 15 years ago or something. And it's like the only palette I've used. And uh, it's like my favorite palette. It's like I, I, I told all my students always to go buy this palette because I think it's the best palette. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just recently told somebody to go get it. Uh, and I found out that they discontinued <laughs> the shape that that i have and uh it's called the academian confidant and wow, and name. that's up yeah there with right jade, jade glue <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, we we wrote my my friend wrote to them actually to see if they had any plans to make it again and 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 they said if enough people were interested they'd start making it so while i'm here i'm going to put a plug if you have any interest in this palette <laughs> Write to New Wave Palette and tell them that you want one because they are. They're like the greatest palette. Uh, I would. I was so, so disappointed the that again. they discontinued it. Uh, so New Wave is the company. Academian Confidant is the name Academian of the shape. Academian Confidant. And, and what's uh, the shape? It, Can you describe the shape? It is like, uh, it's this really weird, crazy, organic kind of shape. It it has these cutouts, so it's like it fits to your body. <laughs> so right. all the weight Contours. winds up on your on your yeah, on your torso. And um your, your they have a gauge. lot of Yeah, it it's sorta of, it's great because it's it's balanced really well and, and then all the weight goes on your torso anyways and and uh and so you know people I, I've known a lot of people actually who um wind up with like thumb i was gonna ask you i, I got palette. one of those wooden pallets and i was like oh my god you're gonna get repeat strain if i use this thing if i keep you, using this thing yeah you will with a lot of them and and i i always recommend this one to people who have that problem because uh none of the weight goes on your thumb and and, and i've yeah, actually right. had had people i know who had issues and like took my advice and got this palette and they're just like, Oh yeah, this is great. This is fine now. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it really, it really is. It's, it's pretty great. And I feel like now that they don't make them anymore, it's this insanely valuable commodity that I have. I'm suddenly terrified. Something's going to happen to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, sounds like there's a gap in the market there. New wave. <laughs> <laughs> How do you check yourself as you're working? You know, like some artists like to turn the canvas upside down or they 
they've got like lots of different mirrors around or they take pictures on their phone. I'm guessing you don't do that, but maybe you do <laughs> they get their friends in. What sort of things yeah. do you do? Um, I do look in a mirror pretty regularly. Uh, I find that that can be helpful. Um, just, just to clarify, do you mean you look at the painting in the mirror or you look at you? Cause the way you I, said it sounds I, like I look, you know, I look in the mirror. <laughs> search my soul for the answer <laughs> uh i do i do look at the painting in a mirror i don't take pictures with the phone uh i i don't i don't ever find that really terribly helpful um i also have never found turning it upside down very helpful i know some people do that I, in my experience I, I don't know i i just feel when you turn it upside down i just feel like everything kind of looks fine when you turn it upside down like i i never find that it like alerts me to a problem particularly um mm -hmm. and uh, so i i don't know i've never found that one terribly useful i i do find a mirror uh, helpful um uh i do step back from time to time um but uh for the most part it, it, as much as anything i think i just kind of sit and stare and and just ask myself like does does this make sense you know uh, do, does yeah. this theme like it's doing the thing that I'm trying to, to make it do. And, um, you know, so I kind of lots of times will, particularly again, if I'm, if I'm sort of putting elements together that maybe aren't all in front of me at the same time, um, you know, will kind of really, um, sort of, you know, I, I suggest this a lot to people is actually just to imagine that you could kind of like jump through the picture plane and like, and like walk around inside your picture, uh, like it was a, a real world, you know, and not like a yeah. painting on a two dimensional surface. And just ask yourself, like, does all this kind of feel like it makes sense in the same world as each other? Um, and yeah, yeah. that's actually a big big part of it more than anything probably for me is really just asking myself like does this conceptually make sense as a space to me with with light coming from a a, a direction you know wherever it's coming from yeah yeah very good i wonder um with the turning it upside down thing is that more uh, is that done more by um figurative or you know like i know with faces it's really helpful when you because you stop you can't it's, when it's the right way up you keep your brain keeps making meaning whereas when you turn it yeah. upside down it stops and you just start to see it as a visual thing more which with the i'm guessing with the still life you wouldn't have that same kind of thing um i don't know i mean i i think that there are similar um tendencies to get you know sort of caught up in whatever the subject is but I, I i don't know i mean you know i guess other people find that helpful um but you know i always think back i, I don't know if you've ever seen this it's like a little i don't know if optical illusion is the right word for it but it's like a little trick right where uh you look at this thing and there's an image of a face that's upside down uh, it's like a photo from a magazine or something of a person you know and, and you look at it upside down and it looks really normal and and then you flip it around so that their head is right side up and you see that like their mouth has actually been cut out and and rotated upside down they've got like an upside down mouth yeah right and you don't really notice it when the picture's upside down it looks sort of normal but then you turn it right way up and you're like wait that's this freaky person with an upside down <laughs> mouth right that's kind of always the way i feel about that and 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 i'm like i don't know i mean if if we can not notice that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when it's upside true. down you know i i don't know I, I mean if if somebody finds it useful i mean they should do it i mean i don't want to stop anybody but but i it, it's hard for me to uh find a lot of usefulness out of it personally yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um leslie smith on patreon thanks for the tea leslie says your work is beautiful She's talking about your work. Uh, you. <laughs> when you have a very dark background, how do you stop the extreme shine of the darks uh, distracting? So how do you stop the extreme shine of the darks distracting? Uh, like in the in the painting? I assume. Yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I would 
definitely that I do a lot um, is uh, your your direction of your brush strokes will actually make a big difference in how much glare your your picture gives off. Um, wow. And so if you uh, think about our paintings, I mean, I, I always say 90% of the time are, are in their lifespan, our, our paintings are going to be lit from above. Uh, it's it's very rare that there's like a really, really strong side light uh, illuminating your painting when it goes out into the world. I mean, right when it's in a gallery yeah. or a, a home, you know, so I, I work under the assumption that that when this painting goes out into the world, it's probably going to be lit from above. And um, so the 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 more horizontal your brush strokes are, the more they're going to catch glare, the more vertical they are, the less glare they're going to catch if the light is coming from above um oh, that's so smart and so when when <laughs> you so paint cool. in the darks um either you know and or but you know either you can uh make sure that your, your moves are all kind of primarily vertical and you'll catch less glare or uh if it's sort of like a simple just dark uh, and there's not a lot of activity and stuff back in there you know once you paint it in uh you can just take a, a soft brush and just kind of rake the paint all gently vertically uh and you, you'll find that'll cut down on a lot of your glare wow i have talked to you know this is episode 280 i've talked to that many artists i haven't heard <laughs> one say that that's so smart very good <laughs> yeah, it, it can make a big difference you know it, and it, yeah. it helps when you're working on it too because usually you know our pictures are kind of lit from above when we're painting on them too and so you know you'll you can see right i mean just make a horizontal yeah, stroke and yeah. then make a vertical one through it and you'll see the glare just kind of go away. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it's genius to just even notice to that. Um, yeah. They're nearly always lit from above. Of course that, <laughs> that makes, you know, it's like a Usually. blinding flash yeah. of the obvious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> Leslie also asks what varnish uh, you use. Uh, I sometimes use uh, Gamvar, which is the Gamblin uh, brand varnish. I use the glossy one, or I use um, the Rublev uh, Conservar um, uh, Regal Res varnish, which is uh, essentially the same product. It's just the two companies' version. Uh, my understanding, at least, is. It's just the two companies version more or less of kind of the same thing. Yeah, that's the one that you don't have to wait till the paint's completely dry to use. Um, I, I don't know how true that is. <laughs> oh, that's what okay. some people say. I I've heard others dispute that fact. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, you're the first person I've heard saying that. Everyone else is like, Oh, it's so great. You just put it on, it's fantastic. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what's what's your hesitation? Like, what have you heard? Uh, so basically, you know, on, on on like, you know, materials, longevity, archivability, all that sort of thing. Um, I, my basic approach is I I'm not a chemist. I defer to you know if a restorer or somebody you know a conservationist somebody like that you know says something i'm i'm generally inclined to believe them yeah. um uh, uh I, i've come across people in that world who maybe question how great of an idea it is to varnish with that immediately uh from mm -hmm. what i'm told uh, or what i've read you know from from them uh there can be issues with uh if your paint surface isn't fully cured um you know all the way dry dry uh there can be issues with the the varnish bonding to your paint layer more than you want it to uh yeah. and so then down the line when that varnish is removed um it, it can have issues you know it may not come off as easily as as you want it to down the line yeah. Um, so again, um, I'm, I'm not a chemist. <laughs> I'm repeating yeah. what I've read. But the read. Uh, natural pigments people are, they're chemists. You know, Ye well, George and I can't remember yeah. his wife's name, but they're, they're Tatiana. big into that stuff. Tatiana, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that they're big advocates of 
I don't want to speak for them, but uh, I I don't know that they're big advocates of varnishing things really quickly. Well, no, just when you were saying that you use the Rublev, that's their brand, isn't it, Rublev? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so is their one slightly different to the Gamvar one? Uh, I think it's slightly different. I'm not sure exactly how. Okay. My understanding is that they're more or less kind of comparable things, I think. Uh, Varnish controversy. (laughs) 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 What? um... (laughs) Yes, sorry. Go on. Yeah, I I, I was going to say, I mean, you know, with a lot of that stuff, um, I I always tell people, I mean, I I think there's a whole spectrum of... um, uh how people feel about those things uh you know i have met people who go so far down the archivability rabbit hole that it, like you know it's almost all they do and it, they're preparing panels and you know making materials themselves and it, it's like they're barely even painting anymore um because they're you know so worried about the archivability of everything um i i think that can get to a crazy level um i mean i think at the other end of the spectrum i mean i think there's people who just don't care at all um who say you know uh and 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 many of whom are honest about it who say "Ah, after i'm gone i don't care what happens to my paintings i just want to paint and i I feel like that's perfectly valid (laughs) um (laughs) my approach (laughs) is always uh to within reason try to be as kind of good as i can about making things that are going to hold up and and i always say i honestly i'm more to the end of the spectrum really of once i'm gone i don't really care that much um but i think in as much as like i am selling these to people i want them to be something that's going to hold up i don't want to sell something to somebody take their money and then have something fall apart, <laughs> right? Uh, so I, I, I try to be as good as I can within, you know, without getting insane. Um, so yeah, I always say, I mean, I, I, I try to wait <laughs> before varnishing something <laughs> as much as is yeah. possible. Is is my personal uh, effort, at least. <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, what kind of lighting setup do you have in your studio? Um, I've had different different setups over the years. Right now, I've got uh, like an LED panel type light uh, that's about, I don't know, maybe a foot or so square, um, which uh, I have it. I, I got this like arm mount that sticks into the wall and uh, so I can kind of move it around a bit. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. But basically that just shines down on, on my setup and, and my painting both. Oh, very good. Yeah. Do you light your palette separately or is that a thing? Oh, well, you're holding it. So you'll be in the light. No, because I'm holding it. So it's right there yeah, by yeah. my, by my painting. Um, so yeah, it's not, not too much of an issue. It's one of the nice things about a handheld palette. Yeah. Yeah. Academian confidant. Is that confidant. It? Yeah. yeah. So, so good. Um, it sounds like a, the name of a Wes Anderson movie or something. Um, <laughs> what, if anything, do you listen to as you're um, working? Uh, usually music. Yeah. Um, um, so, you know, I depending on depending on what time of day it is i'm usually looking for either something that's going to be you know sort of um uh mellow or something that's going to kind of get me moving a little bit on the painting uh so you know who i'm listening to might might change but i usually listen to music um i i find it uh, i i tried for a while um listening to podcasts as i i painted and it it just for me, it was it, anything that I cared enough to listen to, like took too much of my attention to listen to. <laughs> I know a yes. lot of people who listen to audiobooks and podcasts and stuff like that. And it, it just, for me, it, 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 it splits my brain in this weird way. Uh, I find mu- music for me is a lot more 
conducive to painting. Yeah, yeah. I've talked to some artists who um, have the TV on. <laughs> I used to do that in college, actually. <laughs> okay. And uh, we uh, and you know, it, it's funny because it it um, I I would sometimes have the TV on while I painted in college, but I would watch like exclusively garbage, like you know, so daytime like you know judge judy or something like that <laughs> and, and uh it was like <laughs> just engaging enough that it wasn't dead silent but it was like nothing i really cared about enough to really get sucked into <laughs> I, yeah. uh you know with with a podcast or, a, or an audiobook or anything like that it's like anything that i'd really want to listen to i think is something that I really want to listen to, yes. yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, and fully sort of, sort of take in. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. But I, it, no, it's been a long time since I watched, put TV on while I painted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you name your paintings? Oh, reluctantly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, very rarely do do I have a, a particular title p picked out. It, it um, almost I, I would, in some ways, I'm I'm just tempted to like number them because titles are such a um, um, uh, such a I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, almost sort of superfluous aspect of them to me in some ways um, that I, I, I'm always hesitant to even give them one. So I, I, I tend most of the time to give them very uh, just descriptive titles. Uh, very very right. rarely do they have an actual like um, title that I feel adds something. Yes. Yeah. Do you feel that about other people's paintings as well? Um, I think it depends on the, the painter, you know, um, uh, I think, I think some, you know, I mean, there's painters, who I think approach it the same way as, as I do. I mean, I, I think, I think there are definitely painters out there for whom, you know, the, the title is an important piece of, of telling the story, you know? Yeah. Like um, you were talking about Salvador Dali, you know, he springs to mind. He was very, you know, the name was yeah. part of the creative expression and definitely you know um and uh you know so i think for certain people they wind up being a very big big piece of it i mean i, I know you know i mean i i've talked to painters too and i think this isn't uncommon that you know they say the title kind of like sells the painting for them <laughs> you know right. if they come up with a title that you know sort of resonates with somebody it's oftentimes like a big part of you know what actually uh you know inspires them to want want that picture um yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah so sometimes i don't know sometimes i think i should give things more real titles than i do but um but uh i, I don't know for for me they're always kind of an afterthought for the most part well i'm surprised to hear that with the whole you know casting and the whole movie vibe you know because you've got such a story going on in your paintings that you know it's um surprising that that doesn't make it into you almost like delight in it, you know, giving, <laughs> giving a little insight into that. Uh, yeah. Know, ensemble you know, cast. Yeah. Kind of Some, atmosphere. Sometimes they wind up with one, I guess. Um, you know, part of it too is, is um, it, one thing that I always feel really, you know, um, strongly about is that with, with the idea of, you know, sort of narrative or, 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 storytelling um i i'm always kind of of the mind that that there's a a collaboration going on between you and and the viewer that you know you're putting something out there you're putting that that painting you're you're sort of getting some things going but but the second half of it has to kind of be be them right it has to be like their their perception of that that painting because everybody i mean invariably is gonna you know interpret things things differently and and have their own kind of you know um 
meanings that they associate to things and, and world that they create and you know uh in in terms of sort of looking at that and 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 uh i and i of course have my own right that that lots of times you know i may start something just in purely kind of you know formal terms and i just i don't know i like these things together and i don't know why and kind of as i'm sitting and making the painting and you know sitting with it for all this time you know certain associations and stories and stuff start to build up in my mind and and i have my own sort of interpretation of of the painting maybe but i i, I don't actually think that mine is really any different than theirs i think that i'm essentially just a viewer looking at the painting and coming up with a story the same way that they are uh okay, yeah. and i always think that it's a little unfortunate <laughs> that my version of that would ever be considered more relevant or more definitive than someone else's because i actually do think it's kind of the same thing at that point uh and i always think it's such a bummer in some way you know another sort of musical analogy that you know you can sort of hear a song and you know have your own sort of associations and things to it and now obviously somebody wrote that song and they recorded it and sang it and you know you're you're hearing it right uh of course but uh e without fail i always think it's sort of disappointing when you read like what they were actually writing the song about yeah. <laughs> because i always like without fail I'm like oh i liked my version way better <laughs> of what this was about <laughs> like this uh this i don't know this seems kind of dopey uh but it, but it's theirs right and so then it's like oh they're the songwriter so that's what the song is about i guess and i think that that's always uh sort of an unfortunate way of looking at art um and so i'm always very hesitant really to share my my uh yeah, my own yeah. interpretation of it well, that, that because is it is it's just you, my Devin. own interpretation <laughs> that's a very humble perspective <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I, I was laughing uh, because um, I don't know if you do you know Alan Partridge, that comedian is a comedic character that um, Steve Coogan created, but he's uh, it, hmm. it just immediately it came familiar, to mind. But yeah, he's talking to some sure. Irish guys and he's trying to he, this guy's kind of a buffoon character. and He's trying to ingratiate hmm. himself with them. And uh, the subject of U2 comes up and uh, he goes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that song um, Sunday, Bloody Sunday such a good song you know uh, sunday bloody sunday you know hate sundays <laughs> <laughs> completely missing the fact that it's about a political thing in northern ireland yeah right <laughs> sunday bloody sunday yeah um <laughs> but he probably likes his version better <laughs> Oh, yeah, he was completely sure that's what it was about, you know. I hate Sundays. Um, so, yeah, so funny. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, God, I'm really enjoying this podcast. I've listened to a few now and they're brilliant. And there's so many of them. And I've learned so much from listening to them. And you know what? If I met that John Dalton fella in real life, I'd love to buy him a cup of tea and have a chat with him. I'd love to do that every month if I could. Well, now you can. The tea part, at least, because this podcast runs on cups of tea bought for me by people like you who listen to the podcast and send me the price of a cup of tea once a month through the Patreon account. That's patreon.com forward slash John Dalton gently does it. All one word. And if you're one of those people who already send me cups of tea through Patreon, thanks a million. The tea is lovely and I really appreciate it. Now, the great thing is that if you can't afford to send me the price of a cup of tea or you don't want to, that's fine. You still get exactly the same podcast for free. It's sort of an honor system where the people who can afford it and want to pay for the people who can't or don't want to. So it's all lovely. So if you'd like to send me a cup of tea once a month, you can do that through Patreon. I'd really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference to me. Um, Catherine Engberg on Instagram says, how fun, as she's talking about our chat, I'd love to hear about your process of arranging a still life. Does it start with one object of inspiration, a color palette, 
Um, and how often does the end result align with your initial inspo? So you you spoke about the how you arrange it, but how often does it uh, the end result align with your original inspiration? Um, it's a good question. Um, hi, Katie. <laughs> um, oh, you know her. Good. I do know her. She's another uh, instructor at the GCA. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, I think it depends. Um, um, I think it always evolves. Um, and I think it's never exactly the thing that it started as. And I, I think there can be really big, uh, uh, steps that it takes away from the original idea, or I think it can be really subtle steps that it takes away from the original idea. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I gave the example of the chicken earlier, right? where, you know, the, the whole idea of the painting sort of just worked itself right out and it, it just turned into a completely different thing. That happens a lot. Um, I, I think to me, lots of times, I mean, I, the um even more so than a than an, an an object or a set of objects or composition or anything I, there's sort of like a little bit of a i hate to say vibe but kind of a vibe <laughs> or like a feeling that i i, I kind of have in mind that i that i want something to have and um or a particular sort of quality to the light you know something like that and um once the actual painting is going and you know the 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 sort of architecture of the picture like the objects or you know the composition or everything once that's kind of kind of pinned down uh, um I, I think it always takes lots of um subtle shifts throughout the course of the painting of exactly what that painting is going to be um which probably to anybody looking at the painting wouldn't really feel like a thing right they're like well no it's a picture of a cup and a an apple and it's still a picture of a cup and an apple and, and it is right and they haven't moved around or anything right um but but within that uh, i think even just little color shifts little changes of value edges little light effect things can to me, I think change um, change what that picture is all about uh, in subtle ways, but in 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 actual ways. And so I think they all take sort of a, a journey first in the you know conception phase where you know the big big changes are happening of just like you know what's this going to be of, um, which may change a lot, may change very little from from where it started, but uh, but but I think always it, it winds up going through a, a subtle kind of series of shifts, you know, about of what's going on in there, just as you know, little lighting effects and things kind of kind of change throughout the course of the picture. So I think it's always a kind of a journey to see like what what's this thing going to become in a way, you know? Yeah does that make it difficult to know when it's finished um i i think no matter what it, i don't know if there's any way of painting that makes it easy to know when it's finished <laughs> um you know you've obviously been teaching for a while <laughs> that's a very good answer <laughs> um you know but um i i don't know maybe i i think some things are easier to know than others may or some paintings maybe um you know i think for the most part um in large scale in large phases i mean um it's kind of easy to know when you're done because you've kind of just gotten to the end of the process um you know that there can be little tweaks and things that you make at that at that point um but i i think that 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 ending phase i mean in in almost any manner of painting um can kind of go on as long as you let it <laughs> and um yeah. it, i think you yeah. can you can 
like noodle with something for forever. I mean, I mean just, I mean, literally forever. <laughs> um, I think for me, uh, there's usually a point at the end where I, I just start getting antsy and I'm kind of like, I, I think I've done all the main stuff I'm going to do here. Like I'm, I kind of know what I want to do for a next painting already. And and usually that to me is like, what, once I've decided, you know, once I have an idea for like what the next painting is going to be, I'm just, okay, get this one done. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to kind of move on. Um, and, and I, um, I used to, I think, spend a lot longer in the end noodling phases than than I do now, <laughs> and and I I've I've kind of gotten better at that over the years. I think uh, that I'm kind of more more okay with like letting something go and be done, which I think is kind of a I don't know, kind of a journey in and of itself, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lizette on Patreon, thanks for the tea, Lizette, says, how do you decide, how did you decide to focus mainly on still lives? Yeah. Um, in a way, it sort of um, was just an organic kind of um, process. Uh, so, you know, I had mentioned earlier that uh, when I studied uh, back at an atelier in Oakland before coming to GCA, you know, we did all still life and it, it was all just a, a means to an end, right? A, a way of working yeah. out some technical stuff, some learning some some things like that. I think around that time when, you know, when I started kind of looking at it more, um, I still kind of had the idea in my head that I was probably going to be some kind of a figurative painter. And, and, and um, uh, I found myself kind of, kind of gravitating towards it just a little more. And I think there's things that um, there's, there's multiple things that I like about it. Um, I think, one is um, I like that it has a potential for narrative without being overtly narrative. Um, and I've never personally been super drawn to the idea of making narrative paintings in the sense of, um, you know, like this is the, battle of whatever and here's the guys at the battle and they're doing the battle and right um i think i mean historically there have been i mean just loads of amazing amazing paintings that are done in that vein which i love and look at all the time and think are great um it, it was never particularly what i was drawn towards doing um uh, i do like that you have a potential for open-ended narrative i think with a, a still life right that has some breathing room to it um i i also think that there's an element to it um that always feels a little like play to me <laughs> um that as you're moving your stuff around and deciding on your your kind of composition and stuff um it it kind of feels a lot like when you were a kid and you like set up all your action figures into a big like arrangement of some battle scene or something right uh which i i sometimes i kind of have a theory that maybe that's why kids kids toys and things wind up in still lives a lot <laughs> mm. I, uh because you do see a lot of a lot of sort of childhood objects being painted in still lives that's very true. frequently and i, I yeah, think there's yeah. Maybe some kind of a connection there. Maybe I'm making it up, but um, uh, there's also definitely a practical element to it, right? I mean, you can do it in your home, <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, you don't need a model. You can do it by yourself. You can make your own hours. Uh, you can paint in the middle of the night if you want to. <laughs> um, uh, there, there are definitely practical um, uh wouldn't say it's necessarily the reason that I do it, but but there are some practical things that are nice about it. Um, uh, I also think it gives you a nice opportunity to play with painting a lot of different things. Um, and uh, I'm uh, there are some things that pop up in my paintings like multiple times, but um, for the most part, I, I like painting different stuff um, that... 
Um, I wouldn't necessarily be somebody who was super happy painting the same thing over and over again. Um, I don't think that that's a value judgment or anything. I think that there are people who make, um, you know, fabulous bodies of work, uh, specifically with that idea in mind that they dive so deep into one subject and just paint it over and over and over and their paintings just get richer and richer and richer. Um, I think that can be a really, really great thing. Um, but uh, I, I tend to gravitate towards having a little, um, maybe more variety. Uh, and, and I think it is something, it's a genre that lends itself very, very much to doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, it's, I think if you did do narrative painting, you would be very good at it because I'm thinking of that one I put up, um, it's of, it's like a few studies of baby, uh, chickens and it's just oh, called yeah. chicks, <laughs> which I thought yeah. was a very funny name. <laughs> uh, for it but the um the there's one where it, you know the 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 chick is in action and uh it's yeah. very expressive i thought wow you oh. really ca captured the that movement you know so oh, thanks yeah that yeah. it was sort of the idea i was talking about earlier right i mean of you know it's uh, all of those were done from um a, a couple really sort of um stiff clunky looking little little taxidermied chicks that i have here uh, and so in a in a very general way they were kind of you know i was using them as reference but all the poses and stuff were just kind of made up you know um and wow that's amazing i, I was i thought you were gonna say uh, oh yeah fran had a box of little chicks and i just you know like what you were saying about your dog you know that you just kind of not from life but from you know the memory of life yeah well i, I mean it's sort of from yeah i mean the uh, i guess i mean mo mostly just kind of imagination I, I mean i've like seen baby chicks before in, in my life but um but yeah i mean it w was just kind of playing with the idea of trying to Pull different poses, different expressions, different attitudes, you know, uh, um, mm. and sort of give them, give them that. I I am sort of doing uh, a couple paintings right now that have some some birds kind of interacting with one another. So you could you could sort of think of them as narrative in a sense. <laughs> mm, <very good. laughs> Uh, Evan Thomas Lilly on uh, from Patreon. Thanks for the tea. Evan says hello, Mister Cecil. Wishing just as as an aside, how did you end up with a double barreled name? It does not sound like a Carol Californian sort of <laughs> name. Now that could be just me stereotyping people, but oh, I, I think it's a very Californian sounding name in a way. Is it um, okay? Uh, so it it's it's pretty straightforward actually um uh cecil was my mom's last name and wishing is my dad's last name and uh so when they had kids uh uh they just decided to give us both of their names both um their names, yeah. and uh so you'll you know you i think you maybe meet more people with hyphenated last names like that in California than you do a lot of places. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I see where like from, uh, because I, I, I'm Irish and I live in Ireland, the, you, know, you generally the, those kind of names, you hyphenated names like that are usually from the British aristocracy. <laughs> That's where I associated with, you know, oh, so, uh, interesting. so it seems very unusual, you know, to for someone in California, but yeah, you, you, oh. from, now that you've explained <laughs> it, it's like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know? Yeah, no, yeah, I got, I got it from the the hippie end. <laughs> <laughs> different, different, different rationale for the same result, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so back to Evans. Many questions. He has a few. Uh, hello, Mister uh, Cecil Wishing. My question is on a hypothetical meeting with a historical artist in a modern setting. Would you rather a Go to a Starbucks with William uh, Adolfo Bougarou, or B, go to Dunkin' Donuts with Charles Bark. 
Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I, hmm. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, I would be very interested in meeting both of those people and very, um, not excited by either of those places. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, I, when I was first a student at, at GCA, I, my night job was at a Starbucks near Times Square and it was, uh, maybe the crummiest job I've ever had. So I'm going to, I guess I'm going to go to Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> just for that reason. Um, I don't know. Either one of them would be a, a pretty interesting brain to pick. Um, uh, I I think technique wise, in some ways, I I'd maybe be drawn to to Bougaro, Um although I think they're both great. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I guess if I had to pick, I might I might pick Bougaro. <laughs> okay and would you ask him the controversial did your wife paint half the paintings question <laughs> <laughs> i yeah I, I guess i would <laughs> tell me the truth and you won't have to drink the coffee <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it would be the, both of them would just complain the whole time yeah, if you brought them to Starbucks and, and uh, Dunkin' Donuts, they'd be like, where, where are the croissants? Where's the good food? Where's the good coffee? Uh, yes. Evan's, Evan's second question. Uh, what do you believe are the compositional differences between a boring, in inverted commas, still life and an exciting, in inverted commas, still life? So what's the difference between a boring still life and an exciting still life? Oh, huh. um... I think there's a lot of potential ways of answering that question. Um, I, I think ultimately in some ways, um, I think the execution uh, um, really makes the difference um, in that. I think you, can have a phenomenally um, mundane subject that's painted really beautifully and it's not boring. Um, uh, compositionally, I mean, specifically, um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's tough. There's, um, there's a lot of different ways of approaching composition, I think. Um, um, I, and I know for myself, um, I, I always like the idea that, that it feels like there's some, some sort of movement throughout it, uh, that you're getting some, some, you know, just variety, uh, in terms of, oh, shapes, textures, you know, colors, things like that. There's, there's, um, kind of maybe a, I don't know, slightly modern trend, I guess, that I'm maybe not always a huge fan of, uh, which I, I sort of call like the the, the anti-composition composition, which is the uh, like stick something exactly dead front and center and then have absolutely nothing else happening in the picture, um, which I, I, again, I mean, can be done well sometimes. I don't tend personally to gravitate towards it a whole lot. Um, I guess compositionally speaking, that it, to me, it, that's maybe not the most exciting uh, way of organizing a picture. Uh, um, but I, I think it's it's tough. There can be a lot of ways to make something interesting. Um, you know, I think you can do it through technique. I think you can do it through composition. I think you can do it through uh, narrative, through subject, through context. You know, um, I think anything can kind of hook somebody into a, a painting, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I think any of them can be kind of, kind of ways of, of, you know, uh, approaching building interest, you know? 
Very good. Evan's third question. This is a question on reference Im imagery. Uh, if a yeah. painter was to make a still life from the actual object and another based from a photo of the same setup and lighting scenario, how would you describe the different results? It's tough to answer it, um, in that it's always easier when you've got a, a, a um, the person asking the question there in person because you can sort of try to get a sense of, uh, of exactly what they're getting at. Um, I think there's multiple ways to kind of interpret that question maybe. Um, uh, I, I don't know Evan. <laughs> He's like, I've known a couple of the people who ask these questions, but um, so I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't want to put words in somebody else's mouth. Um, oftentimes what I find though is that when 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 i get questions uh, about like well what if you worked from life and what if you worked from a photo and like what would the difference be and 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 things like that it, there's um maybe a little bit of an agenda in terms of like well couldn't i do it from a photo and kind of pull it off and make it the same thing like why would it matter right um um and there are ways we could kind of approach it that maybe I'd be less um, uh, likely to go into. I mean, you could talk about technical differences about like photos flattening shadows out and making edges sharp and things like that, right? I mean, the, the difference from a technical perspective about, you know, how, how a photo is maybe seeing things differently than your eyeballs are. Um, but to me, the thing, I mean, we could also take it from the perspective of like, well, what does it allow you to do versus, versus not do? So if you, uh, we could sort of answer it from the perspective of, well, if you had the real thing there in front of you, you could get up from different angles and investigate things and see what was going on up there. And you could like find out a lot more about your subject that might help give you some information uh, that maybe looking at just a photo, you're, you're, you're stuck with what you've got there on the surface of the, of the photo paper. Um, to me, the thing that I would say, and, and the way that I would sort of maybe in some ways be most interested in in kind of approaching a question like that is is to speak essentially from from my own interest in picture making and um to me uh i think there is ultimately a uh, a very different activity being done when when we're painting from a photo um and to me when i look at all the all the painters who I, I really, really love and who I, I think are just like, you know, who inspire me, who make me want to get up and paint and make me want to get better at painting. Um, they were looking around the world uh, and using their paint as a way of putting that down on a surface. Um, that that act of painting was the trans information from real life to an image. Um, and when we outsource that to to a, a photograph, we, we outsource a lot of what I really think of painting as being. Um, by the time that it's already sort of two dimensionalized for us, a lot of decisions have really been made by that by that camera. Um, one of the things that I think uh, can be a way of sort of you know approaching it is um you know i always think of there as being a lot of power in limitations in a way um in, in the sense that um and we talked about it in terms of palettes earlier right that um that that when when you limit your palette down right there can be there can be a strength to that right that um that uh subtleties come out that you know you you can really get all these you know great sort of nuances and stuff and and you see it right you see it in older paintings right that um there's you know if we go back 400 years to you know rembrandt or somebody and and look at the pigments that they had available right it's 
like so much less than what we have now. And, and, and there's a different look to that, right? That, that they were forced actually to really like manipulate those materials they had in just every conceivable way. And they got so good at squeezing everything out of what was there, right? Um, that when you look at um, like a Franz Snyder's, for example, um, it does these amazing animal paintings um, or like a, um, a, a Honda coder or, a, or a, you know, Paul DeVos, right? All these old like animal painters from, from, from back in those, you know, general, <laughs> general era. They just have these phenomenal, phenomenal animals that they painted, right? And, and they're lively and they're jumping around and there's dogs fighting bears and, right? Like, <laughs> it's like all this amazing stuff. And you look at the portrait of the dog and it's just like this amazing portrait of a dog. And, and, and they did all that without photos, right? Um, that to me, it's like, well, what did they do? What did they do instead? Right. Um, and it's like, well, they did a lot of learning instead, right? Essentially, right? Is they like really studied dogs and they went and looked at dogs and they drew dogs, they made sketches of dogs, they looked at dog anatomy, right? Like uh they did all these things. Um they worked out all these thumbnails of how they wanted the dog to look and then sort of pieced together things. They did all this stuff to come to this like amazing understanding of like what a dog is, right? Like what a dog is all about. And I think that that's one of the examples people give a lot, right? Like, well, if you, you know, wanted to paint a dog or something, well, you'd have to use a photo to paint a dog, right? Like, how can you paint a dog without a photo? Like, well, the way these guys did, right? They did all these amazing paintings of dogs, right? Art arguably in my mind like way way better <laughs> than like a lot of the paintings of dogs you see from photos right um and i think that there's a strength to that limitation right that this whole language of painting was developed really from the necessity of like i've got to figure out a way to put that crazy moving creature onto a canvas <laughs> right <laughs> um that whether we sort of like it or not, when we bypass that uh, and we say, well, I'm going to take a photo of a dog and I'm going to paint from that photo, that comes with aesthetic baggage. Um, it changes fundamentally, I think, that activity of painting that dog. Uh, and to me, I'm so much more interested in the former uh the idea of having a camera do all that work for me and then sort of you know essentially working from that it, to me is a much less interesting activity it sort of it's like it zaps to me all of the excitement all the sort of interest all the all the reasons that i'm doing what i'm doing <laughs> it sort of uh sucks away from the the process um so i don't know if that directly answers your question or not um but i i hope it maybe kind of does yeah that's brilliant that's another that's another thing i haven't heard any i haven't heard it described like that and of course when you say it it makes it's obvious uh but i think in my mind and maybe in a lot of people's minds um for me i was kind of thinking uh, that the photograph I didn't really think of it as as the camera being an intermediary or in the way, if you like, of the process of me trying to make a painting from what what I'm seeing. Uh, I kind of yeah. was thinking of it like, well, the camera's just going to help me. I know what I'm seeing, and it's you know all moving, so I'm going to get the camera to you know freeze everything for me it's going to see the same as me kind of thing but <laughs> but you're, you're right it's not going to see but, the same as me it's actually putting this thing between me and the thing even the act of freezing it then isn't seeing what you see <laughs> right yeah right yeah, that yeah. that's then a very very different different experience right and and i i always you know use again it, it it's 
it's sort of like a musical analogy again, but, uh, you know, as compared to like, if you, if you listened to like some really amazing, like ragtime piano player and you said like, Oh, this is just amazing. This, listen to this guy. I want to do that. Right. I love this. This is the greatest thing. Like my life I want to devote to, uh, becoming a ragtime piano player. Right. But then you, but, yeah, but it's like really hard. <laughs> right you're like that guy plays like really fast and he's doing like different stuff with both of his hands and like i don't know but like but you know now we've got all this recording technology right and like you know what i could do is i could play just with my right hand i could play the right hand part and i could like slow it down i could play it at half speed and then i could just record that part and then i could like put that in the computer and speed it up to double time, right? To make it as fast as I want, right? And then I could record separately like the left hand part and I could do that at half speed. And then I could speed that up and then I could put them together in the computer and I could kind of sound like that guy who's playing the ragtime piano. You could do that, <laughs> right? Um, my question is, is that really being a ragtime piano player though? Right. And to me, I would say no. Right. And you could argue, right, that like, well, yeah, but it's just a tool. Right. Um, and it's just helping me to do a thing and it's making it a, a little bit easier. And, and I would argue that it's not actually. Yeah, I think that in that case, it's fundamentally changing the thing that you're doing. No, you're going to learn a lot of other stuff, right? You're going to learn about like computer sound editing. You're going to learn about recording. You might learn about microphones. You might learn all this other stuff that maybe that ragtime piano player doesn't even know anything about, <laughs> right? But I do think that you're then learning a fundamentally different thing. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't receive it exactly like that. For me, it was more like the difference between playing with the live band and playing with the backing track. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the backing track is like the camera. You know, it's like, well, it's the same music, isn't it? It's like, yeah, but it's not, you know, it's a different experience. Um, yeah. Whereas the, you know, the live band, everyone's playing their instruments. It can go wrong. It's a, yeah. there's no intermediary. And you're reacting to one another, right? I yeah. mean, if yeah. you play something that might influence what the other person does, right? There's a, a give and take to that, right? Uh, a backing track, right? I mean, it's it's static, right? It's unchanging. No matter what you do, it's what it is, <laughs> Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Evan's fourth question. Have you yeah. ever looked at a painting from a from a more experienced artist and thought, I'll never be that good. And then years later, you say, actually, I am that good now. <laughs> um, uh, yes and no. Um, and I have definitely seen paintings that I was absolutely blown away by at time at a time and then looked at them later and thought like, Oh yeah, no, I think I actually could manage that probably. Um, I, I, I was, um, I, I, I think I maybe just had like, uh, kind of youthful arrogance and never really, I think said to myself, I'll never be able to do, x y or z i i think i always had it <laughs> for better or worse i think i always kind of had it in my head that like if i really put my mind to it i could learn how to do things um but um but yes I, I, absolutely i mean I, and i think that that's really a a great thing actually um i i, I remember talking with somebody who, it was a somebody who was a student with me at gca and uh, I remember at the end of their their time there as a student, they they were saying something and to me, and they go, "Man, when I first came here, like I thought the the cast drawings and everything were just so amazing, and 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 I just couldn't fathom how they were even made by humans. And now I look at it, I'm just like, oh, it's just another stupid cast drawing. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> and like they were saying it." <laughs> 
kind of like in a negative way, like, oh, this none of this is really that impressive. And I, I was like, that's that's like a glowing endorsement. What do you mean? Like, <laughs> that's what you want to have happen, right? <laughs> but yeah. the thing that seemed unattainable, you're just like, oh, yeah, no, I can do that. No biggie. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, you know, what what we're all hopefully kind of, you know, striving towards. And but I mean, then, of course, you're on to the next challenge. Right. I mean, that you're pushing yourself, hopefully, I mean, to, to you know, go further, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. lovely. Um, how do you deal with self-doubt? Um, I think for the most part, I mean, I think everybody, you know, <laughs> I, I, I always say I think everybody struggles with that. But I think there may be some people who don't. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think... A couple, a couple ways. Uh, I think that that can be a really tough thing. Um, and I think I, I definitely, uh, you know, struggle with it just as much as the next guy. Um, uh, I think a couple things. I, I think one is to keep things in perspective. I mean, I think that um, wherever you're at in the process of, of you know, growth, um I think it's really good to remind yourself how far you've come already. Um, that like absolutely whether even if I just feel like everything I'm making right now is garbage and it's terrible and like all my paintings are <laughs> failures and I can objectively say that my worst painting today 15 years ago would have been my best painting ever <laughs> um, yeah, uh, nice. that that uh, i've you know progressed and i think it's good to keep that in in perspective i think the other thing um that that i think is good to keep in mind is the idea that and and i'm, I'm sure any of my students who might be listening will recognize this but to remind yourself that it's all just forward progress that like there's not an end destination um i think a lot of times we get uh tripped up by thinking like that we should have like arrived already <laughs> right yeah. that like we should be really good now we should have it all figured out we should just be cranking out paintings and making stuff and have all the issues solved and everything and i think the thing i always tell people is like that that day i just don't think ever comes <laughs> you're yeah. always just kind of pushing forward and i i think if you frame it in your mind as kind of a path that that just keeps going i mean until you die or stop painting or something <laughs> you know if you just think of it always as forward motion that you tell yourself you're, you're never actually going to arrive at that end destination i think it's a lot easier to think of it as just progress forward you know yes. I, I think that we we oftentimes with lots of things not just painting not just learning uh it could be with anything we have a strong tendency, I think all of us to think that we're at the end of the story. <laughs> and um, I think it's really helpful to remember that you're, you're just in the middle of the story. Like there's lots yeah. left, right. Um, that, uh, you know, just keep going and there's going to be some ups and some downs and, but there's, there's loads more time. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Um, Carl Janssen on Patreon. Thanks for the tea, Carl. Says, hi, John. Thank you for choosing this wonderful painter I didn't know of and I'm glad to learn more about. I'd like to know about his use of soft edges versus hard ones, how he strategizes, when to use each, or is it just something that naturally happens? And as well as the overall softness in the subjects. Is Sorry, and as well as the overall softness in the subject, is he deliberately often giving less notice to the details and simplifying for the sake of a stronger whole and beauty? I ask as a detail nerd in recovery, trying to grasp best how to simplify. 
That's good. That's good. Um, I'm I'm another detail nerd in recovery, so I can relate. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, so as far as the edges, um, I think there's different different ways you can kind of think about it. Um, I, I think sometimes the uh, thing, I mean, the subject being described by the edge, uh, it gives input, right? So um, if you've got a cast shadow coming from really far away, it's going to be, you know, just a softer edge than, say, maybe a contour uh, of an object, for example. Um uh, some people use, you know, soft and, and, and sharp edges to create, um, depth in their picture. There was, um, I forget, I always forget that the, there's a, like a Dutch word for it that, you know, uh, I never remember that, that, um, it translates something into like thick air, <laughs> meaning that in their still life, they would basically kind of utilize at the idea of atmospheric perspective, to like squish miles and miles of atmosphere into the space of about a foot of depth, <laughs> right? So that, oh, you know, yeah. things further back in the picture would be a little softer and stuff and, and it would help them sort of recede where the sharper stuff would be kind of kind of up front, um, you know, is one way of kind of, kind of thinking about it. I think that there's also um, overall tendencies right so i mean if you look uh i give the example of like um uh Gruz, uh as a painter who keeps everything sort of soft there's still a hierarchy of some things being sharper some things being softer but it's like all pretty soft uh mm. in, in his paintings you know as opposed to somebody like um memling right who were like very crisp you know sort of sort of in focus pictures um as far as detail um i think one helpful way to think about it or, or, or that can be um helpful is there's always more detail that could be added in <laughs> right um that uh depending on because you can always zoom in closer right i mean that um uh you know I, I use the example of portraiture a lot right um that we can all kind of think of like a quick a la prima portrait right that's like maybe pretty rough and brushy and then picture a portrait by like you know bougaro or somebody like that right um and we all kind of recognize pretty quickly like well there's a lot more detail in the bougaro than there is maybe in a quick you know um sketch right um, but there's loads of detail that he's leaving out in those portraits, right? I mean, he's not painting like individual pores and things on those people's noses, right? Um, mm -hmm. That if you look at like a, um, you know, like an early Chuck Close painting, right? He really is, right? He's got like yeah. a six foot head. He's got every pore and bit of stubble and stuff in there, right? It's like massively more detailed than the Bouguereau portrait is, right? Now, I'm not saying that makes it a better or a worse painting, right? Um, yeah. But there's lots more detail, right? Um, I don't know that it inherently makes it a better painting. I don't think it does, right? Um, mm -hmm. But even in that painting, um, there's detail that's not included, right? If we were really looking at that head that closely, there'd be like little cracks and texture in the skin and stuff that like if you looked at it like super close you know that you would see that's that's not in there right so th there's always more detail if you just look closer right you're never gonna get all the detail <laughs> right yeah you're always putting something in and leaving something out no how much of that you want to put in and how much of that you, you want to leave out it becomes a very subjective uh, choice right um now it's not like an either it's detailed or it's not equation right it's a whole spectrum right uh from like the most detail heavy painting you've ever seen uh you know to like a very very quick you know super rough like you know uh sketch or something um so depending you know deciding where you're on that spectrum you want to be i th i think is very very much a personal decision some people love getting in and putting every single pore and 
some people don't, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, that you, you can have a great painting that exists at any level of of detail. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I'm somewhere in that spectrum, right? Some people would call my paintings really detailed and some people would say they're not very detailed at all, <laughs> right? Uh, depending on where, where they each each sit on that that spectrum, you know? Yeah, is the is it a uniform thing for you? Like, I'm gonna. This is as much detail as I'm gonna ha have. Or do you, you know, like say with portrait painters, that they nearly always, you know, they'll make something of the eyes. They want to draw attention to the eyes, so there'll be yeah. a bit more detail there. Do you do a similar th kind of thing? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. some portions of my pictures are much more detailed than others. Yeah. 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 And what are you consciously guiding the viewer's eye with that or what's your reasoning for choosing one way to you know one i'm going to have more detail here and not here yeah yeah i mean definitely it uh has to do i mean partially with where where you want the viewer's eye to go i mean there's gonna yeah. you know tend to be more detail in the the focal points of the picture right um uh, sometimes it can just be proximity, you know, um, that if something's like way out in the corner of the picture, it just might not need that much detail really. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that you maybe don't want their eye there so much. Right. Um, that was one of the things that I was actually really, really struck by. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I was just in Amsterdam looking at paintings and, and, um, uh, it's amazing when you look at so many of those older painters i mean you know you look at a i keep using rembrandt as an example but you know you could use a lot of other people too um definitely there are sections of his paintings i mean that are just phenomenally rendered um but there are vast areas in those paintings that are painted in so quickly and roughly uh it's just that like the color and everything is really, really good, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's uh, really, really broad, big, simple decisions. It's just they're really good decisions that, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you look at, uh, you know, a portrait, a, you know, half length portrait or something. It's like the eyes are really rendered. The hand might be pretty rendered. And then the whole close taking up, you know, 60% of the whole canvas is like, painted in like five minutes or something you know it really yeah. really simply stated um and I, I think it's a good example of i i don't think that more detail in that clothing would make it a better painting it would make no, it a more but... detailed painting right yeah. um but i don't think it would particularly make it better you know um and so I think that contrast is what makes them electric you know, you kind of you you're captivated by the details yeah. and then you wander, mm -hmm. your eye wanders and you go, my God, you know, I, I, my brain has been putting so much information in here and it's just like so brushy and yeah. <laughs> nothing. There's nothing here, really. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely like a there's a practical element, I think, to that, too. Like, I mean, you, you know, I always think, you know, I always just sort of imagine those guys workshops and. Like, I'm sure, yeah, he could have spent, you know, days and days and days and days painting, like, all the detail in that that shirt, you know. But in that same time, he also probably could have done, like, you know, three other portrait commissions, and, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, so, you know, I think, again, there's oftentimes I think there can be, like, kind of a, um, uh, a relationship between uh, necessity, right, and and the things that these guys really invented or came up with or you know driving sort of the the style and the the aesthetic and um i think that you know that's another good example of to me what probably was like you know kind of a practical concern turning into this like really aesthetically amazing way of handling things you know where you do get all this rich variety of like detail versus kind of rougher areas <laughs> you know yeah yeah i'm just smiling to myself here thinking about like how much salesmanship Rembrandt must have had to do with <laughs> as we mentioned the very direct uh, dutch people who i'm sure would have come in and, and went 
hang on a minute, I've just paid you for this uh, portrait and you've only painted yeah. half of it. You know, you haven't painted my shirt. <laughs> and yeah. then he would have had to go, no, hang on. I could have, but let me explain to you why yeah. this is so much more interesting, you know? And then, uh, then yeah. eventually he would have gone, yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> well, I was just reading, you know, about, you know, a lot of the cities in in in, in Europe, you know, in, in, you know, I mean, for hundreds of years had, had, you know, guilds and things. And, you know, so they had, you know, like the painters were like the, each town would have their guild of St. Luke and that would, you know, encompass all the painters and some other people too. And, and, you know, I was reading about some of the, some of the functions that those guilds, you know, like served as, and, and, and one of them was like, actually like arbitration, <laughs> like that, you know, if somebody commissioned a portrait from somebody and they did it and they were like, well, this portrait sucks. It doesn't look like me at all. <laughs> they'd take it to the guild and they'd look at the person, they'd look at the painting and like make like an official, you know, decision on these things right? Wow. <laughs> because yeah i think that there were i mean i don't think people were probably any different than they are today you know uh i'm sure there were plenty <laughs> of people who got their paintings and were like no i don't like this right oh. uh you know you read i mean in rembrandt's biographies and stuff i mean there's there's records of him you know trying to track down payment for paintings he's given to people and He's like, I gave it to you six months ago. Can you please pay me now? Like, <laughs> I got bills. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's all the <laughs> all the same stuff that painters deal with now. You know, I mean, yeah, <laughs> or anybody yeah, else. You know, I mean, really. <laughs> um, Mariana Eniva on Instagram says, "I have a question about your devotion to GCA." You taught so many artists who made their name painting still lives. I wonder how did you decide to be a teacher? So you've touched on it, but if there's anything else that, that uh, this question uh, inspires, feel free. Um, yeah, I mean, so I didn't, <laughs> I guess I didn't really decide to be a teacher. It sort of just happened in some ways. Um, you know, when... Uh, I was still back in San Francisco before coming to GCA or anything. My first teaching gig, which I mentioned earlier, it 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 kind of fell into my lap in a way. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, I, I was working at kind of a random job, and I was just like, well, this teaching gig pays better than <laughs> the job I have now. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it'd be kind of silly not to do it. And um, and uh. But in doing it, I, I really quickly, uh, you know, found that it, it was something I, I enjoyed doing. Um, and um, I think that there's a lot of really nice things about it. Um, I think one is, um, I think being a painter, uh, you know, I mean, painting uh, is a pretty solitary thing. Uh, and I, I like spending time alone i'm i'm you know i'm i'm like a pretty good pretty good at like being by myself <laughs> but uh you know it, it's also nice to actually interact with you know other human beings from time to time and talk and <laughs> do all those things which you know i think going going back and forth between the two i think is, is a balance that i i enjoy um but i i think that there's a a lot of things that that's nice about it i mean i think it is uh rewarding work to do I, I mean i think it's nice i really enjoy seeing people like you know get it <laughs> right yeah. like you know come and want to learn the thing and then like you really see them making progress and it happening for them and i think that's a really great great thing um uh i also think it it really does make you as the teacher think about things in different ways, um, which is, is a valuable thing as a, as a painter. Um, mm -hmm. And lots of times, you know, um, I'll, you know, over the years get questions from students where I'm just like, Oh, uh, 
God, I don't know. I've never thought about that. <laughs> right. I'm like now yeah. I have to think about it. Right. <laughs> um, I'm like, okay, now I'm curious. Uh, I don't know. Let me see. Uh, you know, and it does deepen your own understanding of what you're doing, you know? And so I, I think that there's a lot of benefit um, to a teacher from teaching as well, you know? So I, I think that, that that's another thing that, that I think um, anybody who's, who's teaching and really, you know, trying to, you know, do it well, <laughs> will, will, you know, I'm sure receive that benefit themselves as well. You know. Yeah, that's lovely. Uh, Bia Yingli, I hope I can pronounce that right, um, on Instagram, said, um, having an idea of what your teaching does for others, I wonder what teaching offers you. Puzzle solving uh, for the perfect analogy. Uh, there's all question marks <laughs> at the end of these. I'm doing my best to go up at the end to convey that. <laughs> okay. uh, a calling to save those afflicted by years of terrible art instruction. Uh, I can't imagine it would be possible to teach if you were, uh, if it were a depleting task. So I'm wondering if and how it replenishes you instead. So looking forward to hearing the interview. Yeah. I, I mean, I think in some ways it's kind of the same question, right? I mean, I, I is, think yeah. I, I, I sort of just answered it in a way. Um, um, I, it is... It, um, I was going to say it's shocking, but it, it's actually not shocking if you think about the system. Um, it, it is amazing how many people have had terrible experiences learning art. <laughs> um, anything, and I hear the full gamut from people, um, everything from you know, just not being able to get information to like outright abusive <laughs> teachers. <laughs> I mean, there really are like an insane number of horror stories. And, and the thing um, that I think is, is so unfortunate is how low the bar actually is <laughs> um, to, to be someone who, <laughs> Who teaches art i mean it really like is kind of amazing and and i i've been really lucky I've, I've had a lot of really really amazing teachers uh not just at gca but uh, all my teachers at gca were really amazing but um but i've had a lot of other amazing teachers prior to that as well um but you know like like a lot of people i, I i've also had some who weren't as amazing <laughs> and uh um in retrospect i think looking back on it you know i i really look at some of those experiences just like why did i even put up with that like why did i think that was okay like i thought that was like good at the time like if i got any little scrap of any kind of information uh, it was like you know felt worth it or something and and, and i think it was a combination of things. I think it was a combination of being really hungry for information and not having a lot of access to it initially, right? And not really knowing where to go for it and going to the places I thought you went for it and <laughs> being, yeah. you know, uh, not given much. And I think a lot of people have that same same experience. And 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 I know for myself, uh, especially when I got to to GCA and and started studying there as a student it was like I was like oh my god like I just learned more in like the first month than I learned in like four years you know like yeah. it, it there was sort of this experience of like oh like I didn't actually know it could be like this this is amazing <laughs> right <laughs> like why isn't everywhere like this and and, and the the and, and I think there's actually a lot of reasons why it isn't, but, um, but um, I, I think lots of people have that experience, and and I think that uh, it is a really nice thing if um, if you can sort of work with somebody in that capacity, and 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 they start to see like, oh, like you, yeah, you can shoot, you can actually teach this stuff. <laughs> Who knew? <Yeah. laughs> right. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, I, I mean, that, that definitely is a, you know, a, a nice 
nice thing. Um, I, I, I don't find it depleting actually. I, I, I actually find it, uh, the majority of the time, uh, very energizing, uh, to get to spend time with people talking about these things and, and other people who are excited about the same stuff and like hungry for the same kind of information and things that, that interest me, you know? Um, yeah. so that's a, that's a great, you know, it's a nice thing. Yeah. Lovely. And varnishing controversy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And where else would we go for varnish? Where controversy? else would you get that? Where, <laughs> would you, where else would you get anyone who cared about varnishing controversy? Um, uh, Ilya Shess, I hope I got that right on Instagram says your art and teaching plans in the near future and 10 years from now. <laughs> um well i'll start with the immediate um my immediate teaching plans uh i've got a workshop at gca <laughs> next week <laughs> um uh this december um i'm gonna be teaching workshops in vienna and then in the uh san francisco area um ongoing classes at gca uh, as always um uh in terms of the future um you know at no point in my life would i have guessed 10 years prior that i would be doing what i was doing <laughs> um, and so uh who knows um a, a lot of things could happen in the next year um i i am at the moment, uh, actively, uh, very, very much actively uh, carving out more painting time for myself um, uh, during during the pandemic, I, I, I was teaching a lot, <laughs> and um, I'm I'm gradually sort of ramping down a little bit. I'm not going away. I'm not going to stop teaching or anything like that. Uh, but I'm definitely. Um, C committed to trying to get get myself in my studio more and more uh and i'm i'm already sort of doing that so um uh that that is definitely part of my plans in the future very good uh raquel cox on patreon thanks for the tea raquel says his work is amazing i would really like to know if he has a favorite among all the paintings he has done thanks hmm um I can't remember who it was but um I I I you know it's one of those artist quotes that you hear that floats around um somebody asked them what their what their favorite of their paintings was and 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 they said the next one <laughs> uh which i i always maybe somebody will remember who it was but um I, that's always kind of my feeling um is i'm always most excited and interested in the one that i'm about to make and um yeah. i i actually take a very um uh casual relationship to my paintings once they're done like once they're done i'm I'm a little bit done with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> not in a negative way or anything like, not like, oh, I never want to see this again or anything like that. But um, but I'm usually happy to see them, you know, go out into the world somewhere. Um, of of the ones that I I, I have, it, it, in all honesty, I'm a, if, if it's not, aside from the next one, it's usually the last one. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, so... It, this one right now I, I mean like just literally the other day i was doing these little you know head studies of my dog and 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 i think i just like it because it's my dog but they were really fun to do and, uh, <laughs> so right right now those might might be my favorite <laughs> oh, very good uh what sort of price range are your paintings selling for at the moment um anywhere depends on what it is i mean of course but um anywhere from two to ten thousand in, in general depending on size is it uh, size complexity yeah 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 
Do you have a big art dream you'd like to achieve before you die? Hmm. Um. It's tough. I mean, there's things that I'd like to see. Uh, museums that I'd like to visit. Uh, I've never, never been to the Louvre. I'd like to go there. <laughs> I'm sure it's not like, you know, too far off in the future. We're talking about one of these days going there, but, uh, um, you know, honestly for me, I, I think I just want to make paintings that I feel, um, uh, are, are better and better. Uh, you know, I, I think if, uh, if, if I feel like I've made forward progress <laughs> throughout my time painting, I, I think that that would be uh, honestly my biggest goal. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's so lovely. Um, okay. This is my last question. I ask this to everyone. Uh, yep. If there's one thing you could pass on to future generations, what would it be? Hmm. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I don't. I don't know if I'm particularly going to pass this on, but. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe for somebody I'll play some small part in it. Um, I think that uh, more than anything, uh, to me, I think I would like to see people keep making things from scratch. <laughs> um, it almost doesn't matter to me even what it is. Uh, it could be a painting, it could be a shirt, uh, it could be a meal. <laughs> Um, I think one of the things that I think is really, really phenomenal about painting, um, is it is really something that you kind of make from scratch, um, that it's not a kit, it's not a purchase. <laughs> um, it, I think that one of the things I guess you could call it like a pet peeve of mine uh, is how frequently we're sold the idea that consuming is creation, <laughs> that uh, you can pick between these five colors of phone cases and that's meant to like express your individuality. <laughs> uh, and I think with, you know, and I think it's only going to get more extreme <laughs> with all the discussions around AI art and all these other things now. Um, but the idea that like you just sit down by yourself and make a thing, <laughs> uh, I think is more than anything, uh, what, what I would hope gets passed down in general, um, uh, to, any future generation <laughs> yeah that's beautiful and are you encouraged by the level of interest people have in that i know it's not wide scale but the people who get that what they do is amazing i think i i think i mean it's it's really um it's a pretty fundamental I think human drive, I mean, to just make stuff. <laughs> um, and, you know, you see it in uh, manifesting in any, you know, um, almost any context you can even imagine. I, I mean, you know, uh, whether it's somebody just, you know, uh, organizing flowers in their house or planting a garden or, or, or you know, um, you know, I think, people really really do i mean just mentally spiritually psychologically whatever you want to call it uh have a pretty strong need to make stuff to like create actual things of their own um and uh i i think that that's a pretty 
a pretty hard thing to suppress in a way, you know, um, it can get sort of derailed sometimes in weird ways, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think any, anywhere you look, I mean, people have that, that desire and, 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 and that, that sort of need, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's going away. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's been very enjoyable talking to you. I think your paintings yeah, are been a pleasure. amazing. Oh, thanks um, so much. I am not normally a fan of still life. It has to be, <laughs> it has to be stellar, really. You know, I th I can only, I can, I'm, maybe I've had other still life painters on. I don't think I have. David Chavitz is the only one that I stand oh, that yeah, stands out great. to me. You know, yeah. yeah, and um, your still lives are very, very different to look at, <laughs> but they do have that. They're so captivating, you know like your still lives look like uh small little windows into a world i would like to live in you know they just everything just seems so soft and there's so much stillness in your still lives but a very you know i've seen some still lives that there's a lot of stillness in them but it looks like the stillness of a funeral you know or that you know that kind of stillness <laughs> Whereas yours, yeah. it's 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 a very soft, uh, loving kind of stillness, and everything, every object seems to be caressed by light, you know, uh, and 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 by the creation, you know, of like mm. the, the creator, your your hand, uh, yeah, they're they're quite remarkable, you know, like for for a still life to um, convey so much, it's it's pretty amazing, you know, and. Um, yeah, I think they're really good. I think they're really fantastic. And yeah, it's been lovely Thanks chatting so to you and hearing what um, what's going on, you know, in your in the way you go about them. And as I say, you you dropped like I don't know. It feels like three major truth bombs there <laughs> in that conversation <laughs> that are just really, you know, uh, you know. Like I've talked talk to lots of artists and. I can kind of tell now when when someone says something that's pivotal for me anyway, and I, and mm -hmm. I know people listening will find it pivotal as well. Um, mm -hmm. Of like, oh, of course, that's that's you know just what you were saying about the direction of your brush strokes and the paintings generally yeah. being li lit from above. I mean, it's so obvious when you say it, but it's I haven't heard anyone else saying it, you know. Um, yeah. And you, you you did you did that two or three times. So um, Great. yeah, Great it's been that. it's been lovely chatting with you. Great. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Okay, well, I keep in touch with everyone, so I'm sure we'll keep in touch. But yeah, we'll say goodbye for now. Great. Great. Cool. Well, thanks so much for having me on. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye. See ya. I've never felt this good in my entire life. Make me some spaghetti. Actually, I'd prefer a cup of tea. <laughs> cup of tea would be lovely. So, yeah, just a little reminder, mainly because every second or third person who becomes a patron has got in touch with me and said, you know what, I've been listening to your podcast for ages, and I didn't become a patron, not because I don't have the money, not because I don't think it's great, I just didn't get around to it. So this is a little friendly reminder that if you'd like to be a patron, you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, go to patreon.com forward slash John Dalton, gently does it, all one word, or follow the link in the show notes to become a patron. I would really appreciate it if you could do that, particularly if you've been meaning to and you just haven't got around to it. It would be great. It would mean a lot to me. All right. Thank you. Bye. We are the Argyle Pimp. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimp. So buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. We are the Argyle Pimp. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimp.